Welcome, everyone. I appreciate you all taking this evening to spend some time with me today. I, I am Shannon Leem, and I'm the Clinical Director for Aegis Therapies. I support the Home Health Division. And today we're going to talk about mental health disorders and behavior management elements within it and what the SLP's role might look like. Um, we're going to talk about different environments potentially, right? Skilled nursing facility. We might talk about the home health environment. Uh, if you might see this patient on an outpatient basis. So we're going to talk about how that might look where it, in whatever our, uh, environment you might be in. Um, this program that we're going to talk about here is designed to address a unique population of patients that you might serve who have mental illnesses. And for some, this might be a refresher. Um, you know, you may know many of these elements, but we're going to marry it together with the very unique population of those that have mental health uh, illnesses. So regardless of your experience level, this course will provide valuable resources and approaches to use in virtually all uh, treatment situations that might come about. Um, many of the patients that we're going to talk about here may have a diagnosis, an actual diagnosis that you can see in the medical record that is part of this umbrella of a mental illness or a mental health disorder. Others may just be displaying characteristics that are consistent with some of the things that we're going to talk about today. So either, either way, you want to be able to address those uh, in much the same way, right? Whether they're formally diagnosed or just displaying characteristics, um, it's important to, to recognize them when you see them, and it's important to, uh, to address them uh, the best way that we can. So again, I'm Shannon Lee, uh, National Clinical Director for Home Health, and we are going to move forward. Um, just as a disclaimer, I'm not a mental health expert, so the information that's contained, contained today in today's presentation is for informational purposes only. I highly recommend you uh, go and do some research, look, in so, look at some of the evidence-based practices that are, that are out there. I did make mention of some studies that I added very recently as of today that I, when I was looking for some more information for some more case studies or unique elements, I did find a few uh, from Harvard. So I'm going to go ahead and let you know what those are as we go along. But uh, this is for informational purposes only. I have no financial or non-financial disclosures to say other than I work for Aegis Therapies and I'm a, a salaried therapist for them. Some housekeeping elements here. Everybody here is on mute. Put your questions, if you have any, in the chat. Shyla. Uh, is uh, moderating our talk today, and she's going to make sure that she um, pays attention to the questions. And if anything comes up that's relevant to what we're talking about in the moment, she'll she'll break in and let me know because I won't be able to keep track. I don't think during the the course today. Um, there's going to be some polling questions that I hope you all will uh, click through and give me your information. And to obtain continuing education, which we'll talk about at the very end, we will go through the verification of attendance. We hope that you participate so we can see your entry of your response and the polling questions and, and, and elements like, like that. So we hope that you'll be able to participate today. So here's the outcomes we hope to achieve. So we're going to explain some of the key contributions that SLPs can make when working with patients who present with mental health diagnoses. We're going to identify some assessment tools to create appropriate goals with objective measures for patients experiencing communication deficits as a result of mental health diagnoses and related issues. And then we're also going to describe the SLP's role in interdisciplinary discuss discussions about reducing antipsychotic medications use in elderly patients living inside and outside of long-term care facilities. And here's roughly kind of the agenda. As we go through some things, we're gonna go through an overview of mental health, some of the diagnoses and diseases, the responsibilities of an SLP working with this particular population. Then we're gonna talk about those assessment tools go through some behavior modification and behavior techniques. Uh, there's quite a few of them. We're gonna have a lot of examples as we go through those intervention strategies. And then a very timely element um, uh, during these last several years where we talk about quarantining or separating folks from others as a result of uh, infectious diseases. You know, COVID we've been through so for many years now, it seems. I can't believe the word years is with that. 
um, but we are noticing mental health implications uh, with elderly uh, folks who have to be quarantined or segregated away from a, a larger population so that they are them themselves either protected so that they don't become infectious or because they are infectious, they don't pass that on to somebody else. So we know there are very real impacts to those. So we're going to talk about some of those considerations as well. So some broad sweeping elements here. Uh, more and more of our patients in these facilities and in home health have a mental illness as a primary diagnosis or a comorbidity. And this generally means that the patients we're treating now are much more complex and require a detailed look at how these stacked diagnoses, how these, uh, how this list of, of all these elements that are make up this patient's clinical, uh, clinical uh, characteristics, how they impact our therapy intervention, how they impact the assessments that we do. But for the 25% or so of adults with mental illness, there are those who are not formally diagnosed, like we mentioned before. They just demonstrate characteristics that might be consistent with uh, one of the diagnoses that we talk about here today. So even with the diagnosis, many people don't seek treatment. Um, so manifestations of the disease may have a more dramatic effect than if appropriate treatment was in place. So we may see people with the diagnosis without intervention. We might see folks with uh, who have had intervention who don't have a, a formal diagnosis, that they, they never had that formally attached to their record. So there's a lot of different ways that we might see these particular patients. The, uh, mental health illness, illnesses are often unrecognized and not formally diagnosed, therefore the treatment might be inadequate or non-existent. We want to really make sure that we note that mental illness, mental health issues is not a normal process of aging. Some folks, especially when we talk, start talking about depression, some folks, when we really start talking to them and we recognize some of these characteristics of depression and we, we draw attention to it, to the patient, the patient may say, well, what do you expect? I'm 85 years old. My wife has passed. I'm supposed to feel like this, right? This is what 85 looks like. <laughs> and that may not necessarily have to be the case. So making sure that we recognize and that we pass along to the patient that it's not a normal part of aging and it's something that we can assist with uh, not only with the physician to help diagnose, bring their attention to it, but help support from an intervention if communication and cognitive linguistics are playing a role in an impact there. Um, so what we do know that although psychological difficulties that come along in older age are often thought to be mainly cognitive, like uh, the dementia uh, vein, Many of the disorders are the same found in the general population and include general uh, include depression, anxiety, substance abuse can certainly now be showing up <clears throat> in the populations that are in our in our facilities or in in home health. So here are some of the common psychiatric disorders that we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about them in, in another slide. We'll go through each one of them. We're going to talk about depression, anxiety, bipolar, substance abuse, schizophrenia, and a personality disorder. Okay, so from a depression standpoint, uh, we see characteristics that are consistent with an impact on the patient's ability to work, sleep, eat, enjoy activities. Major depression also affects normal ability to function. And we know that dementia and depression can often be confused. We can, a patient with depression can look like somebody who might be showing signs of dementia, and dementia might also mask itself as looking a little bit like depression. Uh, Harvard Health had an article in April of 2022 outlining some of the ways that depression can be differentiated from dementia. So I thought these were really nice bullets that were, can, can help you guys. Uh, the decline in mental functioning tends to be more rapid with depression than with Alzheimer's or another type of dementia. So a more dramatic change in cognition can come about as a result of depression than the slow progression we see with Alzheimer's or some of the other umbrella dementia diseases. Unlike people with Alzheimer's, people with depression are usually not disoriented. So depression doesn't make you disoriented or have uh, difficulty with uh, recent orientation. People with depression have difficulty concentrating, whereas those affected by Alzheimer's have problem with short-term memory. 
and writing, speaking, and motor skills aren't usually impaired in depression, uh, which can be impaired with uh, folks in uh, that have uh, Alzheimer's disease or other dementia-related elements. And depressed people are more likely to notice and comment on their memory problems, while those with Alzheimer's may seem indifferent to such changes. They tend not to bring out or mention out loud, hey, I'm noticing I'm having difficulty with my memory. So that might be leading more to a dementia quality. And then we have anxiety. Anxiety is a normal reaction to stress. Um, it is actually a sign that things are going correctly in the brain. You, you, you want to experience anxiety. It's, a, it's one of those triggers that helps you realize something might not be right. Right, so it's it's a normal reaction to stress. What happens is it be, when it becomes excessive, it can become disabling. Um, anxiety is common with folks with COPD, depression, heart disease, diabetes, and others. I think if we've uh, worked with patients with respiratory diseases um, or cardiac issues, chronic cardiac issues, we recognize that anxiety is very real for them. And condition management and having them recognize their symptoms. Um, can uh, help play a part in reducing their anxiety, recognizing what is something to be anxious about and when is something that is, you know, you don't necessarily have to be worried about it, right? So that, that element of condition management can play a, a good part with anxiety. And older adults explain anxiety differently than younger adults with fewer psychological symptoms and more physical symptoms. So in the older population, their anxiety manifests itself with physical uh, traits as opposed to what we talk about many times. We talk about anxiety where our mind is racing and we can't stop thinking about certain things and what if scenarios and that sort of thing. Bipolar disorder, uh, or it's been called manic depression or manic depressive states. It's an unusual shifts in mood, energy, and activity levels. <clears throat> mood shifts can occur a few times a year or up to several times a day, which is the cycle. So they're a slow cycle or a fast cycle. Um, symptoms of manic episodes are euphoria, agitation or irritation, risky behavior, decreased need for sleep, delusions from reality, and decreased concentration. And symptoms of the depressive side are sadness, hopelessness, guilt, anxiety, and sleep problems. Schizophrenia is where the individual interprets reality abnormally. It gives them disorganized thought, disorganized perception of the of their surroundings and changes in behavior. It can present with hallucinations, delusions, disordered thinking, and their ability to function normally and care for themselves deteriorates over time. Personality disorders, uh, patients tend to demonstrate difficulty perceiving and relating to situations and to people, including oneself characterized by rigid and unhealthy patterns of thinking and behaviors. And this is typically regardless of the situation. So regardless of what's going on around them, they can be very rigid and regimented with how they respond. Frequent mood swings, stormy relationships, social, social isolation, and difficulty making friends. So throughout all of those, often folks with those different diagnoses, uh, they present and have difficulty with the ability to care for themselves or their own medical needs. And so they may then start displaying things that are, are a secondary result of those other primary medical problems. So they may have these underlying conditions of depression or anxiety. And as a result of that, they manifest some of these other elements. So the chicken and the egg issue. So for example, with that, we've got uh, let's say depression, and then they have poor ADL performance, poor hygiene. Um, is it, did the hygiene issues cause their depression, right? Their inability to, uh, to support themselves from an ADL perspective bring about a depression because they felt bad about that? Or did the depression come first? And as a result here, we have the ADL issue. So it's one of those, you have to sort out a timeline with the patient. Uh, pain becomes an issue. Nonverbal um, signs and the, their ability to 
explain things. You might need to pay attention to nonverbal issues, psychomotor difficulties, eating behaviors that result in, mal in malnutrition. Some of the examples that we came uh, that we're familiar with are as a man with schizophrenia may stand for 18 hours a day and he would eat only organic grapes and that resulted in malnutrition, significant lower extremity edema and joint pain. So they have physical manifestations, nutritional manifestations as a result of the mental illness. A person with depression may not eat or drink, resulting in dehydration or kidney issues. And then the physical manifestations of things like anxiety may result in complaints of pain. And there's not a predictive nature on how a patient with mental illness will present. Therefore, it's important to document the impact that each of these ha are having on the patient. It supports the medical necessity, right? Sometimes a, a reviewer, sometimes a, a facility or a caregiver, and potentially even a physician may not see the direct connection between our scope of practice and the resulting uh, or and the catalyst for that, which is these mental health, uh, mental health illnesses. So we have to make sure that we draw that connection, right? That we 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 draw the connection between we have a patient that is having difficulty explaining uh, some of their concerns, explaining the pain. They're having difficulty with med management. They're having issues with um, potentially swallowing uh, as a result of some of the medication. So we have to make sure we draw that connection for them so we have a good foundational uh, for the medical necessity. So here we're going to have our first poll question. Uh, so I think Charlotte's going to populate the poll for us here. The first question is, depression in the elderly is often misdiagnosed as dementia. Is that true or false? All right, we got about half the folks voting. It's climbing. Almost everybody, we'll give it another few seconds. If you see the poll in your window there, make sure you click A for true or B for false on the question that's there. All right, the answer to that is true. It's true that depression in the elderly is often misdiagnosed as dementia. So we wanna make sure that we uh, can be a support system for that proper uh, differential diagnosis for the physician. Second question, older adults often describe anxiety different from younger adults with fewer physical symptoms or uh, terms and more emphasis on psychological terms. Is that true or false? Fewer physical, more psychological. And we are getting a, a split answer. We're about half the people have voted. We're gonna give it another few seconds. And this answer is false. Most older folks, when they complain about these anxiety issues, display physical symptoms. They talk about the physical manifestations of anxiety as opposed to the psychological elements. So that particular question was false. So here, this is not necessarily a polling question, but it's more, uh, well, it is a poll. <laughs> it's asking you uh, your experience. So how many of you have evaluated a patient with a primary diagnosis that falls into one of those mental health categories that we talked about in the last year? Have you had anybody in the last year? A is yes, I have evaluated a patient with a primary diagnosis that falls into a mental health category in the last year. Or B, no, I have not evaluated a patient. Shannon, Shannon we don't have that. We don't have we that. We don't one. have that poll. Well, then we will just move on. <laughs> <laughs> you can stay in the in the questions uh, section. You can talk to me about uh, if you've seen pa patients like this in the last uh, last year or so. You can go ahead and put that in there. I think I would venture. I guess it may be. Uh, maybe 50-50, that 50% 50 of you guys have, and 50% 50, 50 of you have not had a patient with a primary diagnosis in those. Anxiety probably might be in there. Um, depression might also be in there. Some of the others may not be, the schizophrenia, the personality disorders, et cetera, may not be. All right, so now we're gonna get into the role of therapy. So 
many of you are familiar with the restore, compensate, adapt uh, concept here. Uh, so this includes a continuum, right? Restore, compensate, adapt, adapt is kind of a continuum of intervention where you can be in and out of those three elements uh, at any one time. Uh, to work on functional deficits and underlying impairments. So we know that restore works on restoring the underlying impairment. Compensation means the patient learns to compensate for this functional deficit. You can't solve for it, so you work around it. And adaptation or to adapt, you adapt the environment uh, or the caregivers in their approach rather than having the patient have a role uh, in, the, in changing their functional performance. And the role of rehab across all the disciplines centers around the, the ability to promote functional change and to increase independence uh, from a communication standpoint, from a cognitive communication standpoint. And in the next uh, few slides, we're going to detail the role of the SLP. So I think many times we probably, um, this is pretty apparent, right? We would we would expect to address the cognitive communication disorders that includes difficulty with any aspect of communication or any disruption uh, as a result of cognitive impairment from the mental health illness that, that the patient is exhibiting. Those areas uh, may include behavioral self-regulation, right? The patient being able to recognize when something is occurring, when when you know, we talk about catastrophic behaviors that, that disrupt not only the patient's ability to feel safe and secure wherever that might be, in their own home, uh, in a facility, um, but also affect the safety of those around the patient. So disturbing um, the, the rhythm of the environment, right? The, when a patient is experiencing those elements of those catastrophic reactions, um, everybody around it feels it. So having a patient be able to start to recognize a, a level of self-regulation, work on social interaction and functional communication, that's certainly part of the SLP's role here. Activities of daily living, the, the patient's ability to recognize what are, the, uh, what are the activities they need to be performing, how they can perform them. It may not be the physical aspects of it, but recognizing the sequencing and uh, that element of the ADLs learning and academic performance, right? We talk a lot about, uh, talking about the elderly here, um, but there may be some younger folks where you may be called in to support them from the academic side of things, as well as vocational elements. So here's some four bullets that we, uh, again, continuing in the SLP scope of practice, information processing with the ability uh, with the impaired ability to interpret and respond to incoming messages, including general comprehension. So the patient's ability to navigate that sensory input. Many times um, our facilities are a cacophony of sounds and smells and uh, all kinds of input, right, that they have to sort through that they may or may not be successful with. They may be so successful they tune everybody out and they have no interaction whatsoever, or they hear everything from everybody and it's too much. So the ability for them to sort through the salient elements that they need to be able to pay attention to or recognize when those things are getting too much and how to, again, self-regulate, remove themselves, or having the caregivers around them recognize this particular environment is going to create a situation where the patient's going to feel uh, unsafe and have difficulty. Under pragmatics, um, loose associations, making connections that shouldn't be made, impaired topic maintenance, the patient can't maintain several exchanges in a conversation uh, where they maintain that particular topic or they shift topics very abrupt, abruptly and expect a listener to be able to follow along. A patient may demonstrate low affect or limited gestural communication or facial expression and lack of initiation. They kind of let the world happen to them as opposed to having an impact on their environment. And many of these elements might be something you can have an impact on. At the very least, it's something you can recognize and help educate the either the facility staff or the caregivers or the family to help them adjust uh, with the patient so that these things don't lead to um, difficulties. Naming and fluency. Often with schizophrenia, you see alogia or po poverty of speech. Generative naming is an issue. 
Uh, and then we have sometimes impaired syntax and phonology resulting in disruptive speech, neologisms, uh, made up words, unusual word formations, and strange language structure. And then we get into the, some of the cognitive linguistic elements. We have the attention span, attention elements, which is sustained attention, selective intelligent, alternating or divided attention, all of which can be something you can test with a patient to determine are any of them uh, something that the patient uh, struggles with. Um, and then we go into memory, immediate, delayed, long-term, incidental or perspective. Incidental memory um, is remembering something when you don't put any effort into the memory. So for example, I don't know if many of you have seen the video where there are people in a blue shirt and people in a red shirt passing a ball. And the instruction is to count how many times the ball is passed and how many times a blue shirt person gets the ball versus a red shirt person. But in the middle of all that, what the study was is that there's actually a gorilla that walks through the center of the screen and because we are paying so much attention to the ball and the shirts being passed, we don't notice the gorilla there. Uh, we don't encode it, uh, but some folks might. So it's one of those elements uh, where you try to remember something or you are remembering things that you don't make a note of remembering. There was also a study in 2017 that shows uh, age plays a factor in incidental memory. And if you think about it, it's also things like seen while driving. They did a study where they had participants driving a car um, in a simulated environment. It was simulated driving a car. And then they, the participant had to take a test of different things that they saw or did during the driving uh, without having them be told, we're gonna ask you about things you see, right? It's, they thought it was a driving test, but it was really a memory test for the different signage uh, that was out there, people, animals, that sort of thing. And they demonstrated in that study that age did play a factor in incidental memory. They, the the uh, older participants did not recall some of the salient uh, elements that they were uh, that younger folks did did see. And perspective memory is something we can all relate to. It's the ability to uh, remember to remember, right? If you're at work and you say, okay, I have to stop at the store on the way home. I need to remember to stop at the store on the way home. That's a perspective uh, memory element. And then you find yourself at home and you think, I did not stop at the store on my way home. So I think we all have, have had those moments where we, can, we have deficits in perspective memory. Uh, orientation, person, uh, myself and those around me, place, where am I and how do I fit in here? Time and the passage of time, that's also a really interesting one to work on with patients. Um, sometimes anxiety um, makes patients think that things are happening longer than uh, they really are or maybe faster and it's uh, causing them to be upset. They're, they're having anxiety. Um, so I like to have them gauge time when they're working with me. So, uh, you know, we start the session, we'd be working for five or six minutes and I say, okay, this is one of those moments. About how long do you think we've been here? And kind of get a judge from them. Do they recognize how long, how long time has transpired or how long has it been since you had breakfast or uh, how long until you think something is going to happen? How many hours, right? So they can, you can get a sense of what is their ability to navigate time. And then the uh, oriented to situation, what's happened? Do they know why they're here? What's occurred? What's, what's been happening around them? Problem solving, identified problem solving situations, solutions, looking for best solutions, right? I, I like working on that with patients, sometimes very concrete. Uh, they have very concrete solutions, one solution, that's all they can think of. But best practice for a patient certainly is to recognize many solutions to a problem. And if this doesn't work, what else can you try? Okay, those two things don't work. What else can you try? Um, or what can you try uh, are also enlightening. And then executive functioning, which we know is the very high level elements, high level cognition, high um, cognitive load that the patient must use, which is volition, planning, purposeful action, self-awareness, and self-monitoring. Um, self-monitoring can also go into others, right? I can monitor uh, the ability to monitor their own expressions and what's happening around me, sort of the ability to read the room. Um, 
Am I seeing what's happening around me so that I can recognize how I fit into that environment? So now let's talk about some of the assessments that are out there that we can use with our particular patients. So the focus of the evaluation is to address the current issues um, that either the patient is experiencing, that we've, that caregivers or the facility staff might be noticing, and uh, and to work on work towards the outcomes that we want to achieve with the patient, that the patient wants to achieve, that the caregivers are striving for. So where it all kind of starts is reading uh, reading the chart, talking to the patient, get the patient's history. You want clues to different behavior triggers, right? Reading through if they've been in, an, in a structured setting like a skilled nursing facility, there might be nursing notes that describe behavioral triggers, something that happens. Um, and you, there may or may not be there in the chart, but you want to ask the questions, right? Um, what is transpiring when the patient does this? Sometimes we just get a description of the behavior of, of what happened, um, but not my, what it might have, meaning what the patient did, as opposed to what was going on around the patient when that behavior occurred. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit later about um, having a behavior log or looking at antecedents and having that analysis. It uh, goes a long way to help you. Um, you want to look for what are they, what do they desire as meaningful activities? What what makes an impact on them? What do they want to do? What do they like to do? Uh, what did they used to do if they were uh, gamefully employed and they had a career? What was it? Um, if they had a lot of hobbies, right? I know we say this when we talk about any old any population we work with, right? We try to incorporate what they know and what they like. Uh, with this particular population, it's extremely important you identify um, things that they enjoy. And we're gonna talk about why that, that's important in a little bit. Um, the history of the patient may help you identify that there may be behavior problems that you wanna put a plan in, uh, a care plan in place uh, at, as a result of the evaluation to support that facility uh, engaging with that patient. Um, I know evaluation only, it's not mentioned here, but I did wanna bring up the concept of an eval only. Um, I think with these patients, especially if we uh, think that there are elements um, that might not be immediately noted at the time of our eval, we want to recognize that we want to be able to be involved in their care over a little bit longer period of time. Your evaluation may take a little bit longer. Your ability to see that patient across different times, different parts of the day, um, to be able to recognize when that behavior might happen. Um, seeing the patient first thing in the morning, you might not be able to see any of the elements that are causing the patient any struggles. They might be perfectly fine. There's no issues. But as a result of the cognitive load of being in the facility all day long, those behaviors manifest themselves after dinner or, or in the afternoons um, or when they don't get their way uh, or their quote unquote their way, their schedule is interrupted. Right, so you want to make sure that you are attempting to see them in the environment at the time when these things happen, so you can be of support. Um, so it may take out a take a few days to be able to get to the heart of these things, um, and see what parts, uh, what you can do to to analyze the time of day, uh, what's happening around the patient to have these undesirable behaviors happen. So here are some of the uh, actual assessment tools, the names of the assessment tools. We're going to talk about some of the, uh, and these have come recommended for folks with uh, mental health disorders. So there's the Nursing Home Behavior Problem Scale. It's a 29-item inventory of serious behavior problems that tend to be disruptive or stressful. The ILSS or the ILSSSR is the Independent Living Skills Survey, and it reviews um, certain tasks, such as taking care of their personal appearance, money, possessions, their residence, uh, and their health, finding and keeping a job, interacting with others, that, that sort of thing goes through those elements. The ACL, or the Allen Cognitive Level, is a predictive assessment that's used with uh, dementia diagnoses, but was actually started with uh, patients with mental health disorders. 
the Geriatric Depression Scale, or the GDS. It's a brief 30-item questionnaire that asks the participant to respond yes or no to how they've felt over the past week. The interest checklist, or the modified interest checklist, uh, gathers information on a client's strengths of, uh, strength and interests and engagement in, a, in 68 activities of the past, currently, and in the future. Uh, the main focus is on leisure interest and influence activity choices. Then there's the Hamilton Anxiety Scale. This scale consists of 14 items, each defined by a series of symptoms and measures both psychic anxiety, mental agitation, and psychological distress, and somatic, uh, somatic anxiety, which is physical complaints related to anxiety. Then we have the RIPA. Most of you all may recognize the RIPA, the Ross Information Processing Assessment. It takes approximately 30 minutes to complete. There's several subtests, 10 to 12, depending on which version you're giving, and they can be used to diagnose mild to moderate or severe cognitive linguistic problems in the elderly population. And then the Sensory Diet Checklist. It's a checklist of activities that are done to help decrease or prevent stress, like movement activities such as riding a bike, swimming, yoga, touch and temperature items like weighted blankets, using a stress ball, twirling your hair, going barefoot, auditory or listening activities like the sound of a fan, white noise, rain, birds chirping, and then vision or looking activities like snow falling, window shopping, waterfalls, and smells like scented candles, herbs, spices, chopped wood, and then gustatory or chewing activities like crunchy foods, sour food, blowing bubbles, biting into a lemon, or chewing ice. So those are great assessments. Um, I recommend uh, putting a few into your repertoire, Come become familiar with them. The only way to become familiar with them is to start using them uh, and see if they start helping you identify some elements to work on with your patients. So I think this is really, this is, this is also a big, the big crux of some of, of these types of patients that we're gonna talk about. Rapport that is, so, is something that's established over time, but it's, it should be one of your first considerations when you meet a patient for the first time, right? And I think with, with much of our other population, our patients, the typical patients we see, whether it's in home health or in a skilled nursing facility or as an outpatient with the geriatric population, um, we, we have the typical interaction. Hey, I'm Shannon. I'm, I'm going to be your speech therapist. I typically come to see patients who, who are admitted to the facility or I have an order to see you as a result of your doctor. So we're going to dive in and do some, do some interactions today. We're going to take a look and see how things are going. And then we have our questions and our assessments that we go through. Um, with patients who have a history of either depression or mental illness, like anxiety and schizophrenia, your first interaction with that patient may be perceived a lot differently than we um, are used to. And we wanna make sure that we recognize that, that if we see in the chart that this patient has a primary diagnosis or has a series of diagnoses that are in this under this mental health umbrella, that we recognize that your approach and rapport with this patient need to or can look very different. So it's going to take some time. This is not a patient that you rush with. And I, and I don't mean to say that we rush with our patients, but it's certainly one where you might you may want to talk slower. <laughs> and as a speak therapist, I'm the first one to raise my hand. You all have probably heard me speak very quickly here today. <laughs> so uh, slow down your busy therapist world and uh, work on the your connection and your relationship with the patient. So take a few seconds to slow yourself down before you race into the treatment space or, or into the patient's room. Um, and show interest, right? So some interest to, in the patient. Take time to build a relationship um, and then make sure that the patient recognizes um, your, your interest in them as a person, not as a diagnosis to come evaluate, or you're not here, quote unquote, because the doctor ordered you to, right? Sometimes that comes off as a little sour to the patient. Um, building rapport or approach and rapport um, as a standalone service is not skilled, right? Getting to know a patient is not a skilled service, right? Um, it, it definitely has to be integrated into a skilled approach with the patient. Um, you have to be genuine. The population, what we're talking about here, can read through a fake relationship. Um, 
I think we've recognized who this patient is. Sometimes you walk in, you say, how are you doing? Uh, depending on how you respond to them and how you or how the, how you come in, they may say, fine, what do you want? Or who are you? Immediately, not responding to your question, but immediately firing a question back at you. Or why am I here? Can you help me get out of here? I'm not interested in what you're saying. I need this addressed for me. Um, so these responses, along with their body language, can tell you much about the patient's demeanor and how he or she may react. Hostile, calm, receptive, guarded, all of these are important for you to recognize so that you can build that relationship to determine what's your role going to be in this patient's recovery. Um, I've also found that if you see, um, when you see this patient in the hallway, I think we do this, but I'm, I'm making note of it now, um, to take time to, to stop and talk to them. Um, to take a few minutes to say hi, how are you doing? As you know, how's your day been going? Um, and it has nothing to do with therapy. I'm not here to take you anywhere. I'm just depositing a little good note <laughs> in their mind <clears throat> about me when they see me. I'm I am asking about them as opposed to I'm here to do something have you do something with me. I'm here in this moment just to see how you're doing and say hi or pop in. Um, at a time where you're not going to see them in therapy. Sometimes if they're room bound, you want to make sure that you stop in and say, nope, not here for therapy. Just you were on my mind and I was here. So I thought I'd stop in and say, hi, how are you doing? Take 60 seconds, potentially, if it's a little longer and it builds into something else that's happening. Certainly, if your treatment's going to occur that day, you can roll that into a skilled assessment or a skilled analysis of what's happening. Um, so it may be piecemeal. Your ability to treat this patient might be in short bursts as opposed to a sit-down, knee-to-knee interaction you may have with the patient. So demonstrating that interest, the step, it's more of an art really than a step-by-step -step process. You can't say, I'm going to do this, that, and the other. It's You have to recognize the give and play and the interaction that you have with the patient. Listen sincerely, talk to them daily, make on to eye contact with them, modify your approach with them based on their response. What works, what doesn't work? Your body uh, language can speak volumes to the patient. Any closed arms, um, sometimes they don't like to see your white lab coat. If you wear a lab coat, that might be something that distresses them. So it might be something you think to not wear when you go in the room. Um, or it may help with some patients if they, if you, if you, that makes them feel more protected and more comfortable speaking to you about certain things. They might see the lab coat as a sign of uh, you know, authority is, is not necessarily the word I'm looking for, but might, you might have that air of support to them that they might feel more comfortable that way. Um, so again, having a flexible agenda, have your co-created goals in mind, but know that secondary goals, goals may be more pressing to the patient and working on those may allow you to work towards the more longer term goals later or in a, in a, a second part of your assessment. Working on what is the patient is focused on in that moment might be, uh, might be important. All right, so now let's move into some intervention strategies. So we want to make sure that we work on a program that designs uh, behavioral change that includes both positive reinforcement and the potential for possible negative, uh, natural negative consequences, right? We're not like punishment, but you may, it may result in uh, no extra smoke break if the patient doesn't participate or if the patient doesn't uh, do things to potentially help conform to their own self-behavior, safe self-monitoring, right? If they don't recognize when certain things cause them to fly off the handle or to have inappropriate conversations or make inappropriate comments, having those natural negative consequences <clears throat> might go a long way. So positive reinforcements might be praise, a reward system within the facility or within their home environment. Um, things like manicures, hand massage, uh, playing certain music, a special seat at the table, um, maybe special food delivery. Uh, we had one particular patient that would, um, in the home health world, would um, would pretty much do anything for a, a simple little McDonald's cheeseburger. <laughs> and so we we built this behavior system that if they did all the things they needed to do from the diabetic standpoint, from the from the education with the with the caregivers coming into the home and following the exercise programs they were doing, that 
he would get this reward of this little cheeseburger at the end of the week. And we, we all had to coordinate who was, who was it that was going to be the one to pick up the cheeseburger. Um, but it worked. The pay, that was something that uh, the patient had credence in, right? It was their currency, right? Determining what is the patient's currency might be uh, beneficial. Involving the entire team of caregivers, the more consistency, the more effective. Um, working with the facility staff, if you're in a structured environment where there's uh, facility staff there, um, which I know sometimes gets to be very hard, especially in a staffing crunch, uh, having the facility recognize that this particular patient does better when there's consistent faces around them uh, and people who understand the, their role in his world, um, then when it's somebody new, might help reduce catastrophic behaviors for the patient. Hey, Shannon. Yes. We have a question. It's a billing question. Um, sure. How would one bill for an assessment that takes multiple days to complete? Um, typically, the assessment, it kind of goes into the concept of treatment, right? You're, you're doing a treatment that's rolled into your assessment. If you're finishing your assessment during your, your, your first session, right, and you're, you're uh, establishing those elements there, the continuation of that determination, right? The patient didn't exhibit the behaviors that you thought were going to happen uh, during the evaluation, but you suspect they may occur. So in your eval on that first day, uh, you are discussing the concept of uh, the facility staff, if, the, if we're going to talk about a structured environment, the facility staff explains that these certain things happen. They did not occur during this therapist evaluation session. session. During subsequent treatments or on treatment on Wednesday this week, um, this SLP will attempt to uh, analyze those uh, that behavior when or try to help manifest that behavior, right? How, to see when it happens or, or witness it happening so you can see when those things are going to occur. And those are now going to be underneath your treatment, right? You're now, you've determined uh, through your assessment that you're recognizing some communication issues might be there. You're recognizing there's some memory issues that might be there. You recognize you've read the record. Um, you're putting credit in the nursing recognizing some things happening and you may quote that in your record but now you're you're altering the environment you're changing things so now you're into the treatment intervention you're into you're altering an environment in a way to either see what changes a behavior what manifests a behavior so then it's just falling under treatment in that particular instance so in all likelihood you're billing that under a treatment cpt code i hope that helped uh the question but by and large that's generally what you're doing if you've moved out of the eval and you're now um you know if you're even if you're continuing evaluation elements um you're not billing the eval code on a second day you're rolling that into your treatment because you're continually analyzing what's what's going on you're largely you're probably changing things that are happening you're addressing things that are coming up and that's that's part of treatment intervention <clears throat> Keep those questions coming. If you have any more, go ahead and put them in that things. And thanks, Shyla. All right, so, so the long-term intervention strategies, right, can come into play with um, many, many different opportunities to achieve that long-term goal. So using multiple strategies will reinforce the best possible outcome. So you wanna choose two or three of the different strategies for main, for, for the best impact. So, if you're looking at coping skills, um, this means the patient has to understand their condition. So having them understand elements of their health literacy, right? That might play a role in it, which means they recognize some of the behaviors that they're exhibiting uh, and how to, uh, how to cope with things that trigger a behavior. Optimal communication. And this again might be as a result of you modifying an environment or teaching the caregivers uh, when the patient does this, you say this, and it should elicit this type of a response. Okay, so many different elements that can come into play from over from a long-term care stand, a uh, long-term goal standpoint. So speaking of that behavior modification that was on that list there, let's go into what what behaviors are. So recognize that a behavior is an expression of something, as opposed to acting out or a problem. Right? We we tend to use the word 
behavior as a concept of negativity. But a behavior actually has no positive or negative element to it. Uh, we just, uh, in, the, in the healthcare field, we tend to use the word behavior when we're talking about bad things, things that the patient does that, that are disruptive or harmful. But we need to look at it as what it truly is. It's a form of communication. It's a, a way or an attempt to get their needs met, right? We need, it, we need to use it as a clue to uncover that person's need. It's a message to us. They, this is happening because of something, right? The point of behavior modification techniques is to change undesirable or harmful behaviors and replace them with healthier or more desirable ones. Conversely, if we can't change it, we, that's the best outcome, right? If we change it from a negative to a positive, if we can reduce the amount, the frequency at which the patient has behaviors, we don't extinguish them, but we can reduce the number of them, that might be a win. Or if we reduce the duration of the behavior, uh, if the patient usually has a, a, a meltdown for 30 or 40 minutes to where they have to use, the nursing staff have to use medication to help calm the patient down. If we can reduce that 30 or 40 minutes by recognizing what it is that caused it to help reduce it, we might be able to shorten the time that it occurs, thereby maybe foregoing the need for medication. So the behavior still happened, but we made it shorter in its duration. So both of those are wins in many ways, right? And sometimes it takes that description in the record to say the behavior may still occur or it's not anticipated that these behaviors will be, will be extinguished, but we anticipate there may be a reduction in frequency or in the duration of which. Or we, you know, we're also educating the, the nursing staff how to react to the patient when these things occur, how to communicate more effectively with the patient, right? If we recognize that the patient has difficulty with auditory processing, that means we need to talk to the nurses who are then talking to the patient in a, so that they modify their communication in a way that helps it be understood better, right? So all of those things are to say um, that will go a long way in the chart, right? Many times a facility is concerned about how a state surveyor might, might uh, think about a patient having these moments, right? Um, I'm putting aside the concern and compassion we have for the patient already, that's already there. We don't want them to feel this way. We don't want these things to happen. Uh, we don't want the patients around them to uh, experience it because it, you know, it's kind of a, a, a moment that everybody experiences when one person's having a challenge. So I'm putting that over there, recognizing it's the paramount issue. Secondary to that, the facility may recognize this might be a state survey issue, right? We have a patient that's having these moments that are just over the top, right? Um, and the concern may be, what if we can't stop it? But if we document all the things that we're doing, we meaning the therapist involved in the care, if we literally can write a bulleted note, I, I'm a big advocate of doing this in the, in the discharge summary. When we go through the list, the, all of these elements were attempted during treatment during this care plan, during this certification period. Bullet, uh, you know, analyze the patient across different time times during the day. It's noted that this particular time uh, seemed to yield the highest frequency of this negative consequence. Analyze the uh, the. Uh, noise level during these particular times, and I would outline it. Uh, analyze the foods that were ha that the patient ate during that particular day. Uh, this therapist also examined the medication list to determine if any of them seemed to have any side effects that might contribute. Right? N any of these may be a nope. It wasn't that. Nope. This didn't work. That didn't help. But I bullet it so that it's documented of what's being examined. And then when you can get into the decrease in frequency, decrease in duration. You can see that that is, uh, you can have an objective measure that it seems to be better than it was. So again, it's a team approach, educating the staff regarding the intent of behaviors. Many times, uh, family members included, um, they take the behavior personally. They think the patient is purposefully acting out or 
doing these things to make their job harder or to make living with them more difficult or they oh they know exactly what they're doing don't let them fool you um, and sometimes you have to um, bust that myth a little bit um, and explain what you're finding in your analysis that say well it may appear that you, that this connection is made that you think this cause and effect is happening but during my evaluation i found that this is the case <clears throat> that it's actually a result of this as opposed to purposefully doing this that and the other or it didn't appear that way during my evaluation staff may think the patient is just choosing to be difficult when actually the patient can't control the behavior or we are setting them up in a situation where the behavior can go unabated and when this attitude is present staff members aren't considering the possibility there's a legitimate cause so we have to sometimes break it down and say this is why i think this is happening and the more time more that staff is involved in the solution many times uh, the better adherence to the plan and and help support the concept that for them not to take it personally so in the behavior modification process we want to ask does the behavior significantly violate the rights of others including other persons with dementia uh, facility and family staff uh, ask does the behavior pose a significant to any, a significant threat to anyone's health or safety and does the behavior make it significantly more difficult to meet the basic needs of the patient to, or to comply with regulations? So when is therapy indicated? I think when the answer is yes to some of those questions right there. So as we go through this process, determine the target behavior with the nurses or the caregiver. So what are we seeing that we're concerned about? going through that nursing home um, behavior problem scale. Is it noted in a stand up or start up meeting or in Q&A, uh, co-opy meetings when they go into specific patient interventions? Is it during a risk meeting or interdisciplinary care conference when this is brought up? Sometimes we see it just passing by <laughs> down a certain hall. Uh, sometimes we hear it happening and we head towards it. Um, sometimes your screenings, your quarterly screenings might be something you look for. CNA reports sometimes is where it might show up. And then you want to begin to analyze uh, and assess the person and the behavior. So in a minute, we'll talk about uh, an antecedent behavior monitoring log. It's essentially is analyzing what's going on right before the behavior happens. And I've mentioned a few of them already. What's the ambient sound that's going on? What's medication that's been happening? Uh, what, who are the people around? What's the weather like? I live in Florida. Um, weather is a big deal here. <laughs> it, it's not all sunshine and palm trees. We get some storms here and um, lots of windows in our facilities and you can see the storm and many times that's a catalyst for patients with uh, depression or anxiety really have difficulty with the mood of a storm coming in, right? So that might be what's causing it. Um, the behavior management tracking form is just something, something simple that the facility staff can use to track these behaviors. What, when did it happen? I usually ask for the time, um, the date, what was the behavior, how long it lasted, and what was going on right before it. Just something very quick to track uh, and see if they can't uh, help you analyze what's going on and attempt one intervention technique at a time. And we're going to go through what those inter uh, techniques are. but you don't want to start throwing a lot of things at the patient to modify it because you don't know what works, right? So it's kind of like um, food sensitivity, right? You you eliminate one food at a time or you pull everything off and then you add back things one at a time so you can determine what's the cause. And then you teach the caregivers and the care partners different techniques to interact with the patient and document every step of the way. Simple documentation, things that work and things that don't work. Everything is fair game. So let's go into what's, what are we looking at when we talk about the, the analysis? So we look at physical conditions. Is there any illness, pain, infection, with the medications the patient's taking, any side effects? Psychological conditions. Is there fear going on, loneliness, grief, or depression? External factors such as the telephone or the PA system, weather, interactions with others, environmental factors, sensory processing, uh, modulation, uh, excessive stimulation, conflicting cues, and then task-related issues. Is the patient being asked to do something that's too complicated or has too many steps? Uh, so the patient 
uh, has a has a resulting uh, event from that. So what specifically occurs? The behavior should be described accurately in specific, objective, and observable terms. Hits caregiver with a closed fist versus is aggressive, right? Describe what occurs. Removes dentures during mealtime and cleans them with his tongue versus socially unacceptable behaviors. Clearly, socially unacceptable does give you something in your mind, but we need to know what it is, what's occurring so we can uh, attempt to resolve it. When does it occur? How often does it occur, uh, occur such as the scope? And we're gonna talk about what is the scope on the next slide. Who is it a problem for? Uh, what's the severity of it? Again, next slide, we're gonna talk about it. And the events surrounding it, an A, B, C. Uh, what's the need and past interventions? What else has been done to solve for this? Uh, how long ago were they done? Uh, and what was the result? So here we go, what's the scope? The behavior occurs, and this is how often. It occurs either rarely, which is irregularly, and no more than a few times a month. Occasionally, it's still irregularly, as much as a few times a week. Often, regularly occurring, almost daily, and continuously. It's regularly, many times a day. And the severity, the behaviors are posing minimal risk to the individuals or others, or is rarely disruptive socially, such as anxiety, anxiety, or wandering safely. Slight risk to the individual or others, or is sometimes disruptive socially, such as throwing food and mildly verbally abusive. Moderate risk to the individual or others, or is often disruptive socially, like they're going into others' rooms or wandering unsafely and it's a major risk to the individual or others, or is always disruptive socially, defecating in public or becoming violent. So here's an example of that uh, a behavior monitoring log. Uh, all staff should observe the resident behaviors for the period indicated, identify each noted behavior as inhibiting patient safety or independence. So the start date, the time and the end, uh, and check it if it's something that's just continually happening, the patient's always doing this. Where was the patient in, in the, uh, either in the facility or if this is in the patient's home, where were they? What happened before the behavior? Describe the behavior, what did they do? What did they say? What did the staff do to intervene? And what was the response to the interventions? Did it work? Did it reduce the severity? Did it reduce the time that it happened? So here we have the different intervention techniques that can occur or we can use while working with the patient. Um, and the skill is determining which of these are the most appropriate for an individual patient. Uh, you must document why you selected the intervention strategy in the skilled intervention section of your progress note or your, or your UPOC or your discharge summary. Um, and we're going to go through a lot, all of these in a moment. Um, so this is a big list, so let's see if we can't break it down. Um, I included the definition of each one of these, so I'm gonna try not to read them to you, but I wanted to put them in your handout so you had them. <clears throat> so the bridging technique is facilitating a purposeful, meaningful, or emotional interaction between a patient, a caregiver, and the environment through using the sensory system. So it's like using an object in the environment to connect the patient to the activity of the ADL. So you're creating a bridge for connection to the task to happen. <coughs> Excuse me. Chaining technique. So you're training the behavioral sequencing or links in a chain that's beyond the current functional ability of the patient. So based on your skilled analysis of the patient's best ability to function, the therapist determines that the patient requires facil facilitation at the beginning of the task for forward chaining or at the end of the task for the backward chaining or intermittent facilitation to achieve task completion and a sense of fulfillment and gratification. The chaining technique requires a task analysis of the small steps needed to perform a task or the teachable elements of the behavior chain. So for example, example step one, reinforce its performance, teach step one, reinforce it, match step one, and then ha have the patient do step one, then to step two, reinforce it, then you teach step three, and then so on. <coughs> Then we move to task breakdown. The task is modified so that the patient completes part of the task 
And then eventually you work towards the patient completing the entire task. So the technique preserves a patient's ability to optimally participate in self-cares, as well as a productive or leisure activity to help structure the day, give purpose, promote self-esteem. So if they can do part of anything, you want to strive to have partial completion of a task. So environmental modification technique, I think most of us are familiar with this, external or physical sensory adaptations or manipulations within the setting, uh, like reducing overhead announcements during the day where it's overly disruptive to the residents. <clears throat> the empowerment technique, to give authority or power to someone to make him or her more confident or assertive and to give him or her a greater sense of self-esteem. Empowerment is accompanied and, and accomplished through identification of strengths and abilities and interests. You provide frequent praise and feedback, avoid criticism, and provide opportunities to increase their knowledge and skill. You're empowering the patient to make decisions, empowering them to make choices. The humor technique, the use of funny comments or situations to engage a patient in functional activity or a therapeutic session, uh, you want to make sure that you're careful with, sar with sarcasm or higher level humor. It can be lost on some individuals have difficulty with that cognitive load. Sarcasm is a very high element of humor, so many folks may not uh, understand it. Idea planting. You want to provide verbal instruction or comments related to a target response or activity. <clears throat> Don't try to convince the patient to do a task. Uh, if they don't want to do it or if the if the response is no is no when you introduce it the goal is for the patient to do the desired activity when he or she decides to do the activity um, another concept of idea planting is stopping by the patient's room early in the morning saying hey joe just stopping by uh, i know i'm going to see you later today i've got some great things planned for us uh, we're going to do this that or the other uh, i know i know you enjoy this so i'm going to build some of that in there um, I also want you to think about some other things that we can do when we're together, um, and I'm going to see you, see you later. It's going to be a great time. So you're planting the concept that this is going to be a good day, um, and you've got some great things that are going on. So it's sort of you're setting, you're stacking the deck in the favor of a good day. <laughs> Reassurance uh, to soothe or calm a patient's doubts or fears in order to decrease anxiety and restore confidence. Reassurance can be tactile. Vis visual or verbal, uh, using positive words such as you are safe, I am here, you are not alone, and using soothing touch such as patting him or her on the shoulder, touching the back of their hand, offering them a blanket or a beverage, using a soft calm tone of voice and fewer words might be more effective. Reality checking is a way for a patient to check for them, check themselves if they're having a visual hallucination or an auditory hallucination, or they're thinking through things where they don't think uh, it's reality, having them go through steps to bring them back to reality. And it might be having a trusted person they can go to, um, to say, I think there's a cat in my room. Um, can you come and check? I don't know if it's there, I see it, but it might not be. Um, having them recognize uh, somebody to come back. So that's a way for them to do some reality checking, recognizing that these moments might not be existing the way they think they are. The redirection technique, a refocusing of attention from an undesirable or unsafe task or situation to a desirable safe or task or situation. Reorientation technique, the facilitation of awareness of themselves and others, uh, back to his or her location, the environment, the current time, passage of time, and current situation. We want to make sure that this also, this reorienting, um, does not interfere with anxiety. Um, I think you've probably experienced this with a patient if they don't um, know what year it is, uh, what are the uh, historical elements going on around them, if you try to reorient them and it brings um, distress to them, then reorientation is not the way to go. You don't want to continually try to uh, reorient them to something uh, that is causing them distress. And we're going to talk about validation in a minute, which is what you do uh, in 
as a different approach. Rechanneling is turning an unsafe or disruptive behavior into an activity that uses the same motion, but it's safe and socially acceptable. So if a patient is chewing on a pen cap or a pencil, you give them a stick of gum or a pretzel stick or something to chew on that's more appropriate than, the, than what they're chewing on at the moment. Uh, reminiscing technique, whoops, I don't think we need to review this one. You know, think, think back to a time. Uh, look at this picture and what does it remind you of? I actually have a notebook that I've used for years with um, eight by 10 um, black and white photos in it of old movie stars, of old cars, of um, um, the old phonographs, old telephones, old I've, the White House, uh, Mount Rushmore, those sorts of things. And it's just an interesting um, thing for a patient to look through and it elicits responses. Um, sometimes they're happy, sometimes they're not. I have a picture of the Hinden Hindenburg, uh, might be something that they think of. <clears throat> so it's um, a picture of JFK, some may have happy memories, some might be sad when they think of it. So it's one of those uh, elements that um, it, it really has gotten, I've gotten a lot of use out of it. Uh, rescuing technique, I think as therapists, we've all employed this at one point or another. It's an intervention where if there's a conflict, between a patient and a staff member or between two patients, an outside influence can come in and take over and essentially rescue the patient from the worrisome situation, right? Um, I, I always joke as speech therapists, we always come in and say, duh, we've got ice cream and makes everybody happy. Here comes the speech therapist with the snacks, right? So it's, I'm rescuing the patient from this moment. I'm gonna take you away. We're gonna do something um, uh, more fulfilling than what they were doing at that moment. Sensory intervention techniques, so the use of sensory input, uh, whether increased or decreased, to self-organize and self-modulate to promote their ability to function better in daily activities, like changing the lighting in, uh, around them when uh, ambient lighting is not available, right? So light from outside, you wanna change the lighting in the room to help support their knowledge of passage of time. So changing the indoor lighting to reflect what's happening outside potentially to show them uh, the trigger of events, right? Breakfast is happening, lunch is happening, dinner is happening, bedtime's approaching, right? So you change the lighting to to move them through the day. Uh, and sometimes that's helpful. Oop, and that was too fast. Validation technique. In this approach, reality orientation is not the goal. Instead, you're validating the where the patient is in time, in their mind, validating what they're experiencing. Uh, it's the concept of you don't remind the patient who's asking for her husband that her husband died in 1968. You note that the patient is clearly wanting to talk to her husband and you can just ask what, you know, what, what does he look like? What do you love about him? Um, how long have you been married? Um, acknowledging that she's thinking about her husband, but we don't need to draw her back to the reality that he is not coming. It helps validate that she's thinking about him. And the scenario uh, section, we're gonna go through different scenarios here. So <clears throat> here's a scenario using the validation technique. So the patient and caregiver are interacting and the conversation turns to the patient's husband who passed away several years ago. The patient believes he's still alive and is coming to visit today. The caregiver then asks what things she likes the most about her husband. Since this validates the patient reality of thinking her husband is still alive, it allows her to reminisce about her husband and her connection to him. In this approach, reality orientation is not the goal. Instead, validation techniques acknowledge the patient's feelings embedded in the statements expressed by the patient. Any reorienting, reorienting information that's provided continues to connect the ideas or feelings in the patient's statement to the present situation. Validation techniques work to build empathy and trust. This leads to reduce stress and assists in restoring their ability to participate in their daily activities. So let's go through a scenario using reorientation and reality checking. Mr. Jones had a recent hospitalization to repair his broken hip. He woke up in the morning concerned over his whereabouts. He was concerned as to where he was and what was going on. The nurse assured him that he was in the hospital for a few days to fix his broken hip, showing him his leg immobilizer. 
She reoriented him to his new environment at the rehab center where he, where he will receive therapy to become stronger and eventually return home to his wife. So this is the reorientation technique, which is the facilitation of awareness to himself and others, his or her location and the environment and the current time, the passage of time and the current situation. And then by having him, you or having her draw attention to his leg immobilizer, this is a form of reality checking. It can be a way that he can check back in. Where am I? What am I doing? Oh, that's right. Let me look. I've got a leg brace. I had something go on with my leg. It's my hip. Um, I'm here for rehab, right? Helping him, giving him something to center his reality uh, might go a long way to uh, support his uh, cognitive ability. Hey, Shannon. Yeah. Got a question. Uh, sure. Does the patient we are using these on need to be a, at a certain cognitive level for these techniques to be effective? Um, I think a patient can be at all different levels, right? From a rescuing standpoint, uh, if you think about the rescuing technique um, or a bridging technique, the patient can be very low cognitively, meaning very uh, have, have decreased ability to have an impact on their environment. But if we are, <clears throat> let's say, bridging with them, you're, you're going to use, uh, put the cup in their hand to have for them to hold while you give them sips of their liquid or, or give them spoonfuls of something right they're holding a cup you're making connection to the meal time so that's a bridging technique it helps them recognize what's happening during the meal time if by chance the patient had difficulty with the meal right they were constantly pushing the food away um, moving their head away from the the caregiver who was trying to assist them eating you're helping with the bridging, right? That's a very low cognitive, uh, a patient with a very severe cognitive impairment, but you're bridging the activity. You're giving them a cup to hold. So that's a, that's a very low. Um, and then, like I said, from this, uh, for the reality checking, right? You, that's a little higher level. The patient's going to take stock of what's going on around them and take a role in, take some ownership in, checking in to say what, what is right and what what is right and what is real? What is what do I need to have happen here? So I think all of these techniques can be used across various uh, patients with various cognitive levels. Good question. Um, so here we just mentioned that um, the patient's refusing to eat or drink during meal time. The care, uh, caregiver gives the patient an empty cup to hold during the meal. The caregiver then gives them something to drink from the cup or the tray. This allows the patient to make the physical connection to the meal by holding onto the cup. So this is the bridging technique, facilitating a purposeful, meaningful, or emotional connection between the patient, the caregiver, and the environment or an object through the engagement of the sensory system. Uh, sensory system. All right, so now we're gonna launch some scenarios in your poll. So the question is gonna stay here on the screen, but only the responses are gonna show up in your poll. So scenario one, Mrs. Hampton was exhibiting signs of sundowning. To avoid this evening anxiety, the caregiver was instructed to begin changing the room lighting to mimic the sun going down, showing Ms. Hampton how dark it was getting outside. Then it was time to slow down and settle down for the night. Mrs. Hampton was given special distinctive pajamas by her daughter to help her recognize her evening routine. This scenario is an example of which intervention technique? A, task breakdown, <clears throat> B, rescuing, C, bridging, or D, humor? <coughs> Got 30% voting. About a half of people voted. Make sure you click on A, B, C, or D in your poll. We're not quite to 80%. All right. So it looks like most of you are saying the bridging technique. Some of you thought task breakdown. Um, I could see where you might think that, but this is an example of the bridging technique. They're creating connections. They're creating connections to the activity, to the time of day, to help her recognize her evening routine. This also could have been maybe sensory integration because of the lighting change. Um, 
but the best answer here was bridging technique. All right, the second scenario. The therapist approaches the patient for therapy, but the patient is not interested in the interaction and is looking down and sad. The therapist returns a few minutes later with a funny hat and a red clown nose and lets the patient know that she just wanted to see the patient smile for a minute. So this scenario is an example of which intervention technique? A, humor technique, B, empowerment, C, rechanneling, or D, rescuing? Okay, about 70% voted. Awesome, 86% of you said humor technique and that is correct. This was the humor technique. Okay, as we move towards the end here, <clears throat> we're gonna talk a little bit about isolation or quarantine uh, considerations. And I know that it's still out there, right? With the flu, we've got the triple demic going on now. We've got RSV, the flu, and COVID all still circulating. <clears throat> and when residents are required to be isolated, quarantined, or practice social distancing due to all these medical conditions or infectious diseases or outbreaks, these particular patients are at higher risk for decline. Uh, I think that's that's clear through the studies that have been going on through COVID. And for the patient who's a new admission or a return for, uh, from the hospital, the experience and the environment may be new and unique to them. And long-term residents may also experience a sense of change in the environment and their routine, which is new and can be scary, right? If suddenly now the dining rooms are no longer being used and everybody's in their room, they may have been told why, but they may not remember why. Uh, and it might lead to all of the, the different issues we've been talking about up to this particular point. So many might be in their rooms for their entire day or most of the day, experiencing less socialization and activity and placing them at higher risk for decline or their changes in condition. So some questions to consider when residents are in isolation or quarantines is, is uh, things you want your facility staff to pay attention to. Um, also family members to uh, elderly folks who are staying at home, uh, if they're reducing the number of people that come to see them in their home because they're <clears throat> trying to stay away and, and stay uh, out of the infectious uh, zones of the world, they're staying home more, you want family members to recognize this as well. So are they staying in bed more or sleeping more? Is the patient ex uh, experiencing more anxiety? Are they mentioning anxiety? Are they showing less, less interest in doing their ADLs? Are the patients and their families feeling disconnected? What meaningful activities are the patients doing to fill their day? Do family members know how to use conversational strategies to sustain communication with their loved ones, whether it's through telecommunication like FaceTime or through other avenues? Does the resident have the ability to contact family or friends on their own? Social distancing and quarantine have isolating effects on our geriatric population and can be expected to negatively affect their physical and mental health. And as therapists, I think we have recognized through these years that we have an integral role in helping to mitigate the effects through strong patient advocacy and screening for skilled therapy need. So I know as there, as it's sort of still going around. There's still COVID wings are out there. There's still COVID restrictions in some states. There's still um, certain signs on doors that talk about signs and symptoms to family members or even staff coming in about um, COVID considerations so that we keep our patients safe. And we do this in a way so that we don't have to do uh, these lockdowns, right, <clears throat> to prohibit the interactions that uh, are so vital to the everyday uh, everyday mental health of our of our patients. All right, um, Shyla, are there any other questions in the queue before we wrap up? There are not. I see one here real quick. I have trouble with the with the window, but I see one that says, do you have any advice for handling caregivers that don't do the strategies <laughs> despite being educated multiple times? Um, I did not see that one. Oh, that's okay. Um, 
I do for some reason. It's in a weird little spot. So whoever you were, you put it in a really interesting spot. So congratulations. We almost <laughs> missed it. <laughs> um, but to that end, my advice would be um, you, you continue to chip away. Um, potentially go to a different uh, caregiver. If this is on a unit, right, you can talk to the unit manager, the nurse manager, and explain the situation. Um, explain continue to explain it to that particular caregiver, maybe in a way, in different ways. <clears throat> I say that to, to not be condescending or uh, indict the way that they're, that, you know, that they don't believe you, right, or, or they don't care. But maybe it's the way that it's been described to them about this patient, it has not resonated in a way yet that makes it, that they make the connection. Um, so having that conversation might help. Um, sometimes it might be asking the question, can we move the patient to a different unit or to a different room so that a different caregiver, one who may have the, um, I don't want to say the ability because it makes it sound like the other one doesn't, but ha have the, uh, who has made the connection uh, to what it is that needs to be done. That might be a way to do it. Um, uh, just being frank, I know with family members, um, listening to them is also really important. We talk a lot about listening to the patients and listening to what they uh, want and what their problems are, what their concerns are, uh, but also listening to the family. What they will say to you might be as important, if not also as important, as what you're hearing from the patients. So drawing that connection between the two. Um, maybe they just want to have somebody say, you're absolutely right. N none of this is good what's been happening, how the patient has been declining, the, the way that they have these moments. That You're right, it's not your dad, or this is not your wife. Um, so let's see if we can um, help find a way to, to, to reduce these from happening because it's distressing to them, right? This may not be the person they knew, and they want to make sure everybody knows that, that this is not my dad. I had the same experience with my grandmother. Uh, she was actually in a facility where I worked. And I wanted everybody to know this was not my nanny. <laughs> this is not what she normally does, right? So it's important that they hear be heard as well. Thank you for that question, though. Okay, so our final statement here. So you all have a little bit of homework. So for those of you who would like ASHA credit, in the handouts, there is the ASHA participant form or the bubble sheet, as we all fondly call it, the ASHA bubble sheet. If you fill that form out and uh, return it to Shyla by the 21st, which is a week from today, we can submit it into the ASHA system uh, to give you credit for uh, this particular course, so uh, an hour and a half. So 0.15 ASHA CEUs will be um, recorded to your account. If you do not return it, we can't uh, submit it. So it's important that if you want the ASHA CEUs, please fax that back or email it back to shyla.hamrick at aegistherapies.com uh, for those of you who uh, can email it. If you have difficulty, um, you can't figure out how to get it attached, you can reach out to Shyla as well through that email and ask her for a different method. Uh, I think Shyla also has a fax machine. We can take texted copies. I've had that, a picture of the, of the ASHA sheet as well. So anyway, by hook or by crook, we'll, we'll accept your ASHA participant form if needed. So here I wanted to give credit to Jessica Pranke, who is uh, my cohort who helped uh, write this uh, for speech therapists uh, from our, our larger course on, on mental health. So here's how to contact us if anybody has any questions. And with that, I say thank you for joining me this evening, and I hope you all have a great rest of your night. Thanks for joining.